You're watching Capital Connection from the Illinois State Capitol. Welcome back. Senator Jason Barrickman joins us now, a Republican from Bloomington, as uh, the Senate is back, officially kicking off this uh, week of session or spring session, sort of. There was that one day last month, but now we're here. Welcome back. Good to see you. What did you make of Governor Pritzker's State of the State address last week? Well, I think it was more of a political address than it was really a policy-driven budget address. Uh, I think the governor presented um, a budget that will fit a theme with his uh, re-election campaign. I think he rightly received a lot of criticism for it. You know, he seems to be pitching a uh, one-time kind of temporary tax relief coupled with permanent spending increases that grow the size of government. I think there's a lot of reason why this legislature should give pause and a lot of, uh, you know, we need to dig into what he's proposed, but it just seemed to be full of, you know, it's been called gimmicks. Uh, it seemed like he was pitch, making a pitch to voters, trying to characterize himself for an election rather than presenting an actual budget that works towards some of the long-term issues our state has. Okay, long-term issues. Let's set politics aside, campaign themes aside for a second. Look at long-term issues. Adding an extra half a billion dollars onto the long-term uh, pension debt. Good or bad idea? Adding money to the debt? Adding money to pay down the debt faster. Yeah, I, I think paying down debt is a, is a good idea. I think you need to start, though, the premise of his total budget is he's increasing spending. And the reason that the state's in the situation that it is... The economy grew. But we cannot continue to dig a hole, right? We need to stop the bleeding. The but the one-time one half a billion dollar payment, for example, is not a permanent expenditure, necessarily. I, I agree with the notion of making advanced payments on our pensions. I think we need to reform our pension system, but an advanced payment is a positive. Taking, going back, though, his budget proposes to spend record numbers of dollars. He takes credit for having solved a bunch of financial problems in the state, which isn't true. Illinois got lucky, right? One of the positives of COVID is Illinois, like other states, received billions of dollars. And what we should be doing is using those funds to reset Illinois and fix some of the longer term problems, not just simply grow our state, the government, and spend more money. We pressed your former colleague, Senator Andy Menar, former senator, now deputy governor, who was uh, one of Governor Pritzker's budget advisors last week on this very question. We also pressed Governor Pritzker on this question this week. The Pritzker administration is claiming they're not using federal bailout money, federal stimulus money to balance their budget. But you have to take into consideration that it wasn't just the state of Illinois that got money in the American Rescue Plan. The state of Illinois also got three and a half billion dollars in the CARES Act under the Trump administration and businesses and individuals in Illinois got stimulus checks. They spent that money. The state collected a share of that. So we asked Governor Pritzker earlier this week, isn't that claim at least dishonest or a little bit misleading? Here's his answer. No federal funds are in the budget that we have proposed for FY23, none. Um, the fact is that, that we've had a significant influx of state revenue, the normal lines of state revenue, sales tax, individual income tax, corporate income tax. Corporations have done very well over the pandemic, and we're seeing uh, the, the benefit of that in state revenues. Um, and so collectively, those dollars have literally uh, billions more than were expected, uh, in part because we've had such a great economic recovery, I think, faster than most people really expected. State taxes, of course. I mean, when the economy improves with or without COVID, when the economy improves and tax revenues improve for the state, yeah, those inure to the benefit of the people of Illinois. What do you make of his response? Well, look, again, Illinois, like other states, got lucky. I think one of the effects of COVID was the massive amount of money that came from the federal government. That's taxpayer money, by the way. That money went to all levels, state, local governments, businesses. And to say we didn't rely on that or weren't the beneficiary of that, you know, is just characteristically not true. Here's the opportunity that we had that creates the, the division that exists between the governor and say my view. The governor wants to take all this extra revenue and grow the size of our government. I'd rather take the revenue and fix the problems that we have. You What's used an the example, example of growing, he, he offered to grow the size of the state police by 300 cadets. Are there other examples of growing the size of government? You, you used the example of pensions earlier. Are, are there, I, I, are I there think, examples of growing the size of government? I think an opportunity, our pension system is one of the significant challenges of our state. 
I think there's an opportunity. The dollars that are coming gives us an opportunity to say, let's move off of this defined benefit system that we have change our public policy for retirement plans for state employees to and move in and do to a defined contribution 401k, 401k style yeah. program right which universities have done i believe there's been a very gradual movement towards that i think the state needs to embrace that okay but that's not an, an example again you, you have not provided an example of growing state government with this budget it's an opportunity for us to reform that's the point right this is an opportunity for us to reform our government, not simply continue Explain to spend Explain that. How more does money. more money cash flow in the state budget help the state change a policy over pension plans? I think there are uh, lots of retirees out there who are concerned about the health of their pension system in retirement. But isn't that just a decision? It doesn't require you to have a whole bunch of extra cash lying around. The, the opportunity that exists is to use extra revenue that the state has to force some long-term positive reform decisions right force how let's have a this what this building that we're in is for right it's a political discussion right so we have an opportunity we've seen some of the benefits that have come from changing that retirement system helps the fiscal health of the state we have an opportunity to have that discussion right now but instead of doing that the governor simply says let's just take some of this extra money and put it here we're getting and I'd like we're, to do yeah more. I, I think I, I st you're getting to some of the long-term fiscal issues what's the bottom line could that lead to tax cuts I think there's an opportunity for tax reform in the state, absolutely. Look at our property tax system, right? Our property tax system's out of the whack. The governor says we're gonna try to create some short-term temporary incentives on property taxes. I think, I think property tax payers in Illinois want fundamental property tax relief, where year after year, their property tax bill gets smaller. What Governor Pritzker proposed is, we're gonna put a little carrot out there this year, and then it goes away and we haven't fixed anything. I think we need to fix these things so that future generations can see the benefit of Illinois having gone through COVID, received billions of dollars from the federal government, and made some good long-term decisions as a result. Maybe you've heard it's also an election year. I heard something about that. What do you think about Richard Irvin? Is he a Republican? He appears to be a Republican, yes. Appears to be? Well, I haven't searched his record. He's presented himself as a Republican. He's got lots of policy issues where he, uh, where there's an alignment with Republicans. He looks like a Republican. Uh, who of the candidates could you vote for right now if the election were today? Well, we'll see. The election isn't today. And so part of the primary process is allowing these candidates to put their message out, present themselves to voters. I think it's a very important part of this process. I'm one of those voters, and so I'm learning about these candidates just like everyone else should be. There's a prominent Illinois Republican, Adam Kinzinger, who says every Republican should answer this basic threshold question. Was January 6th legitimate political discourse, as the RNC, uh, the federal political arm of the Republican Party, said in a statement? And would you trust the outcome of this upcoming election? Do you think those two questions are legitimate questions? Look, the, the political discourse question, right, the answer is no. I think when you have riots and violence, uh, people, you know, property damage, there were people who died, uh, that is not legitimate political discourse. And to the second question about trusting the outcome of the election, because that was the core issue, the reason people were there. They were there claiming that they had to stop a stolen election. That was their rallying cry. Um, is it important, do you think? There are some Republicans who feel discomfort with this discussion, and they want to move on from it. They say that on the record. I understand that. It's not a, not a comfortable moment in our country's history. But is there, what is the responsibility of Republicans to explain why we can trust the outcome of our elections? Look, we live in the greatest country in the world, and it's built on this theory of democracy, which allows people to vote. I think while there's always improvements to make the election process better, we want more people to vote, we want to make it easy to vote, we want to make sure that votes are accurately cast and counted. But I rely on those elections, and I think the public should as well. Uh, one of your colleagues, Senator Darren Bailey, is running for governor. And he was in the press conference room uh, in the basement of this building earlier this week. He was there to take a victory lap, essentially, to celebrate Governor Pritzker's lifting of the mask mandate indoors in a few weeks. At the end of the press conference, we asked him this question. With Senator, this whole situation. Legitimate political discourse, and will you come on, will Mark? You accept the election results this year. Will you commit to accept? Let's the talk. Let's let's not. That's, this conf this is over with. I've told you from day one, you can't ask a legitimate question and report the truth. That has will nothing to do with what we're here. Results. Thank you very much. Will you accept the Thank election you. results? Will you accept the election results? 
Senator, you're running for governor. Will you accept the election results? Why can't you answer that question? Should Senator Bailey answer those questions if he's running for governor? Look, I, I can speak for me, Mark, right? And I just answered your questions. I think you did, for the public. But right, should he have to answer public, those basic questions? I, I think our gubernatorial candidates uh, need to set the standard for which Republicans uh, hold themselves to. For me, as a Republican, I believe that voters in this state, in this country for that matter, can have confidence in the election process resulting in, we don't always agree with the outcome, right? We pick, sometimes we pick the winner, sometimes we pick the loser. But the process has worked for generations, and while we'll continue to look for ways to make it better, I think it's something that the public can and should rely upon. All right, there's gonna be a lot of debate in this building this year, this election year, about crime, and especially exploring the impact of the crime bill, the police reform measure that passed in January of last year. For most of this discussion so far, Republicans have hinted, well, crime is getting worse and it might be generally because of that bill. And Democrats have rightly responded uh, in part, well, most of that bill hasn't taken effect yet. Body cameras in big counties have, the end of cash bail hasn't happened yet. But until this week, there were some prosecutors who tried to either bring charges or they had a grand jury who was reviewing charges and they couldn't get charges for felony murder because that bill made some changes to narrow the scope that you had to directly cause murder. And if you were just indirectly involved in a gunfight that led to someone's death, even if you didn't pull the trigger, could, isn't that still a fair, isn't that still justice? If someone didn't actually pull the trigger that killed someone, why should that person be charged with felony murder? You know, I, I think this is a horrible shift in public policy that's occurred. Look, when people, uh, and adults especially, right, who take actions, there are consequences from them. And when people take actions that result in other people dying, they should be held accountable, right? But there are charges for those. Th isn't the question about applying the proper charges and not the improper ones? But, the, but to me, the prop, in the instance that you raised, the proper charge is if an individual conducts a crime which results in someone dying, maybe they didn't pull the trigger, but someone died, then yes, I think they were uh, a principal reason for which the person died, the cause of it, and should be held accountable, including, again, subject to what's happened, but including with murder charges. And in this case, this person was sentenced for, or, or would be sentenced for a crime that could go up to 18 years in prison without parole, so there would be consequence. I don't want to give the false impression that there would but be no the, consequence. But to the victim and the victim's family, is the consequence of the actions they committed, the crime that they committed that led to another's death, is the consequence of that significant enough if the person is sentenced to 18 years, right? The, the result to the family and to the victim is that someone died. And someone died because someone else made a series of bad choices that resulted in someone's death. And I believe that, especially given the world that we live in, where there's a, this tug of war that exists between those committing the crimes and those in law enforcement who are trying to keep us safe, I think, led by Governor Pritzker, Illinois policies have shifted in favor of the criminals. And that sets a very bad tone, and it has a very uh, personal impact to certain people, including the person in the family who died in this instance. I appreciate this conversation because we've been talking about some of the specifics and the policies and the laws. There's also campaign season and there's rhetoric. Richard Irvin has held a few different interviews recently, and he's been running on this tough on crime platform, a former prosecutor, also a former defense attorney. He's been involved in, in courtrooms quite a bit. Um, he pointed at this crime bill, and then he pointed to the eight police officers who were shot in the line of duty in the last year. And he sort of, sort of casually made a reference like they were related. Do you see a link? Well, I, I'm not certain on the, the instance that you're pointing to in there. My, I, don't, I don't know Mr. Irvin, but I know that he's been characterized, someone who's been tough on crime, including in his city of Aurora as but, the but mayor. To, to the question, do you see a link between Governor Pritzker signing that bill and police officers being shot? Yes, I, I think the governor loudly proclaimed a shift in public policy in this state that has, for some people, allowed them to do or uh, enabled them to do things that they otherwise wouldn't do. I think there's certain people in this state who feel less accountable for their actions as a result of the law that uh, Pritzker signed, the legislation Pritzker signed into law. You think there was a, a change in 
public perception. I do. I think no different than, I, I re, I've got three young children at home, right? I tell them, here's the boundaries, here's the barriers. When I tell them the barriers just shifted, there's a reaction from that. And I think we're seeing that reaction in the public. Both how the public and how criminals are behaving and how law enforcement must interact with them. I think as a result of Governor Pritzker's uh, pro-crime law, the criminals feel enabled and those in law enforcement feel as though they've been restricted. And look, the result of this isn't campaign rhetoric. The result of this is that we become less safe. And one of the principal jobs of our government is to keep us safe. And if you've got a governor who's out there leading on, we want to make sure that it's uh, you know, easier to get out of jail. We want to make sure that more people are, you know, have more uh, freedom from the criminal activities that they're pursuing. There is going to be a result in the public from that. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Senator Jason Berkman, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mark. When we come back, Senate Democrat Robert Peters, who was instrumental in passing that crime bill, will join us to respond to some of this discussion. We're back in a moment.